A goalie's nightmare. He charged the cage, black hair wild, body strong, and eyes aglow. He drank from the Stanley Cup eight times, scored 50 goals in as many games, and 544 in 18 years. Often, when he scored a goal at home, he would skate in small, lonely circles while the ice was cleared of programs, newspapers, and hats. More than a hockey player, more than a man, Maurice Rocket Richard was French Quebec at its best. Honorable, dedicated, and deeply human. Rocket Richard probably was the greatest skater from the blue line in. He would come in on a goalie, gathering speed, and he was just scary looking. The Rocket was bombastic and played with enormous force. He was the most galvanic player in the history of the game. Charlie Rayner was a goaltender played for the New York Rangers. Told me a story one time how they played a game in Montreal. The game's out of sight. The Rangers are leading 5-1, 6-1, something like that. And the net is wide open, and Rocket scored a goal, and he said he fired that thing at that net like he was going to put it through the net and out onto the street. And he said, I said to him, Morris, what are you doing? He said, Charlie, I just want to score the goals. Everyone says he just this maniacal drive for the net. He craved goals. Everyone wants to score goals. He craved them. We played for the Rocket because we knew he was the home run hitter. He could put the puck in the net. And that's why they call him the Babe Booth of Hockey. Although Richard's records did not stand the test of time, his popularity never waned. The so Rocket was God to the Francophones. When the Rockets scored a goal, it was just beyond deafening. You could feel the entire forum shaking. It was the Rocket roar. God. <laughs> if hockey is a religion, Maurice Richard was God. Probably Canada's most famous athlete. For the last 10 years in big league hockey, the name of the Rocket, fire on ice, he was described one Sports Illustrated story. Maurice Richard, would you stand up there and take a bow, please? He was the mirror of the French Canadian. He was the one who threw away the uh, inferiority complexes of the French Canadian. I said, we are as good as the Anglophone. So Richard, when he was driving to the net, there was four million Quebecers driving to the net with him. You gotta remember that the French Canadians in those days were like a minority. They were like African Americans were in the 30s in the States, they were dumped on. In March of 1955, the French Canadians' passionate identification with Richard ignited one of the most infamous incidents in Canada's history. 54, 55 season, the team was terrific. He was at the top of his game. And it was a week before the end of the season. And the Canadians went into Boston. And again, the hated Bruins and always a problem there. Of particular concern for Richard was Hal Laco, a former teammate. Laco gave him a cheap shot with a stick, and Rocket never took a back step to anybody. They really, they, were, they feared him because he was a strong and tough individual. Morris, on the other hand, he went ape at the sight of his own blood. In this particular play, Laco accidentally cut him. Morris could see the, the blood coming down, and he just went crackers. And so when he saw that blood, he went after Laco. Now, the linesmen at that time didn't get in between them because I believe they still had their sticks. So he jumped on Morris's back. And now officials are not supposed to jump somebody's back. So naturally, the Rocket thought, this is another player. When his arms were pinned and he broke away, he turned around to hit who was ever holding him. I think he would have hit me or a Bruin player it was unfortunate, it was a linesman. Rocket faced a hearing before NHL president Clarence Campbell, whom the Canadians felt was partial to the five Anglo-owned teams. The owners told Campbell, if this guy does anything, you make sure that you give him the proper penalty or your job is on the line. Whether this type of conduct is the product of temperamental instability or willful defiance of the authority of the game, 
does not matter. The Charter will be suspended from all games, both league and playoff, for the balance of the current season. Now, that's like sentencing a pickpocket to the electric chair. Give me a break. I mean, what, are you kidding? And, of course, the indignity was felt by all of the French-Canadian fans. And when the decision was handed down, uh, it was calamitous. The results of it were devastating to the team. The suspension really hurt us. And we had a chance to finish first, and we did have a good chance to win the Stanley Cup. People in Montreal weren't too happy with Clarence Campbell after that night. A day after Richard's suspension, the Canadians played their next game in the Forum. So there was a great hubbub in Montreal that this was, well, racially motivated, I guess is the only nice way to say it. And Campbell was seen as the English oppressor of the French Canadians. The police thought something might happen. The radio stations are telling people to come down. People are saying as around 8 o'clock that people are throwing beer bottles and other bottles against the building and the glass is raining down on their head as they're coming in. When Jean Drapeau, the mayor of Montreal, saying, don't show up at the game. Don't come to the game. It's dangerous. It's provocative. And Campbell came anyway. Not only did he come, but he came in fashionably late, making sure he drew attention to himself. And there was great booing, and they were bombarded with tomatoes and whatever people had to throw. And at the end of the first period, a youth walked up towards Campbell, a man, and extended his hand. And when Campbell reached to shake it, he swung his fist at him and a tear gas bomb was set off inside the forum, and with the natural reaction to it, people started storming for the exits, and uh, the game was forfeited to the Red Wings and called off. They had to evacuate the whole place. It was a miracle nobody got killed. Then vandals just destroyed downtown Montreal. We used to buy uh, papers from the... Uh, they have these outdoor little cabins outside the forum, they lit the guy's place on fire, you know, and here's the poor guy crying with his place burning up. Trolley cars were overturned, shops were busted, and people were looting. Maybe it was the first time that French Canadian did, uh, you know, uh, did something different, and, uh, and it was the first time that my father realized that it was so important. Well, he was at the game, he was probably stunned by the intensity of the reaction. There was a uh, segment of the population that was aching for a reason to do something, and they seized upon this. So he was asked to go on the air on radio and television to plead for calm. I want to do what is good for the people of Montreal and my team, so that no further harm will be done. I would like to ask everyone to get behind the team and help the boys to win from Rangers and Detroit. Decades later, the French residents of Quebec characterized that night at the Forum as the birth of their movement to secede from Canada and form their own country. I think you could rightly trace the surge of, of French-Canadian uh, aggressive pride to the night of March 17, 1955. There was a, a feeling of empowerment that the riot express that we are taking matters into our own hands we are becoming masters of our own house and this is not a, a riot that we see after fill in the blank team wins a championship i mean this had grave implications for all society this is a debate that continues in canada to this day Of course, Richard came from a you know, French-Canadian family living in the north end of Montreal. Born on August 4th, 1921, Richard was one of eight children. His father was a machinist for Canadian Pacific Railways. They were actually a very poor family. My father had to work very young because he had to help for the other kids in the family. My grandfather and grandmother, the, uh, they had to work also all the time. Rocket was a child of the Depression. He was French-Canadian. Life was not an easy one in the 30s. You had to fight for everything you got. Nothing came easy. And during the Depression, the father got laid off, as many people did. 
There were times when the young Maurice, who had a job in a machine shop, actually was the family's chief provider. Despite hard times and long working days, Richard's father insisted that his sons play sports, especially hockey. Maurice needed little encouragement. He was born with skates on. Baldo is a small suburb. The street and the sidewalk were very icy, so he could keep his, his skates on almost all the time. And he played hockey in the, in the back of the school. And they called it the Back River. It was a creek that ran through the area of Montreal they lived in. And all he did was play and skate like a great many Canadian kids. Organized hockey then was not what it is now. So he got to play a great deal uncoached and untutored and just learned from playing against other kids. He played for the school. He played for uh, amateurs. And at the, at the very start, he was uh, the strongest player on the team. And I remember he scored something like seven, eight, nine goals a game. The first time he tried out for a junior hockey team was in an area of Montreal called Verdun. And they had to pick, let's say, 15, 16 kids to play in this junior team. And they were down to one spot open on the team. Wearing a star-spangled Esso Imperial hockey sweater, the 17-year-old Richard got the nod from veteran players. And they said, the fellow with the stars on his sweater, you know, he's not bad. He, he, might, he might be OK. Fellows who played on that team with him have often wondered, looking back, if he had, hadn't have made that team, if they'd have just ignored him, would he have kept playing hockey? You know, I mean, he was the last man picked on a junior hockey team. That year, Richard met his future wife, a younger sister of a teammate. My mother was not as shy as my father was. She kind of uh, looked at him and uh, liked him at the very start. And, and she made a few passes to get acquainted with him. She taught him how to dance the tango when she was 15, because the players on this junior team would congregate at the coach's house after the practices for milk and cookies or whatever. And the neighborhood girls would show up. She was 17 or 18 when they were married. And everybody speaks of her with great regard. And it sounds like a wonderful relationship, the kind that he needed to have some peace in his life. When he played, this was an outside rink. My mother was there every day. Well, as a 30 below or 35 below, she was beside the rink. I don't think she ever missed a game that he played, or maybe one or two, when she was having one of her seven children. When he wasn't on the ice, Richard worked in a machine shop where it appeared he would stay. He could score, but he was uh, nobody was that impressed with him. His early reputation was that he was brittle. Because in his last two years amateur hockey, he broke an ankle, he broke a wrist. In fact, it was said that he would never be a big leaguer because it was injury prone. And it was very easy to dismiss a player as being brittle. Twice during the war, Richard tried to enlist in the Canadian Armed Forces, but was turned down because of ankle injuries. In 1942-43 season, a lot of players had left the NHL for the Armed Forces. So the Canadians, like other teams, needed to replenish their roster. This created more of a demand for a player than it would have say, in 1938, before the war. So this was an opportunity for Richard. Right place, right time. Well, there's no doubt about it. The Montreal Canadiens, by their own admission, were in bad shape. The Montreal Maroons had folded because of lack of attendance. And there was even some thought, and banished that thought, that Montreal Canadiens might fold. Joining the Canadiens in November of 1942, Richard scored five goals before his rookie season ended abruptly in his 16th game. The first time I ever saw Maurice Richard play hockey, it was around Christmas time, 1942, and the Canadiens were playing the Boston Bruins. Later in that game, he got a terrific body check from a player named Johnny Crawford and broke his leg. So that was the end. Rock Morris Richard was a forgotten man. And he himself told me a couple of times he was surprised that he got invited back to the training camp in the following October. He thought, well, they're just going to forget about me. All I do is break my leg or my arm every time I play hockey. But Richard had impressed coach Dick Irvin. 
and in 1943, he opened his second season with Montreal. I joined the Canadian Army and I was playing for the Army team in Ottawa and they arranged an exhibition game between our team and the Montreal Canadiens in the Forum. He's a guy who went around me a couple of times, you know, and afterwards we were reminiscing with the, my old coach. I said, who the hell was that guy that went around me? He said, that's the rocket. I said, who the hell is the rocket? Well, we were playing a game in Montreal when Elmer Locke fed Richard the puck, and he took that, but he was going at high speed and was in the net before you knew it. I just said to him, boy, you went in there like a rocket. And I guess Dink Carroll was standing behind me, who was a writer for the Gazette. And he wrote that the next day, and that's how, uh, how the uh, rocket stuck to him. When he was a rookie, they had three or four rookies on the team. So not all of them could play. So the first time that my father decided that Maurice would sit out the game, my dad said, you're not playing tonight. Richard, this young kid who barely knew my dad and vice versa, got the news, immediately turned, stormed out of the dressing room, slammed the door loud enough you think it was going to break, and left the building. Irvin positioned Richard a left-hand shot on the right wing with veterans Elmer Locke and Toe Blake. Soon dubbed the punchline, the trio proved to be Montreal's ticket to success. They needed a closer, and that's what the Richard was for them. They were excellent skaters, wonderful puck handlers who would create confusion in the defense. The rocket would come late, they'd give him the puck, and away he'd go toward the net. It was just a natural fit. So you had Blake to get the puck. You had Locke to pass the puck. And you had this young kid shows up on the right wing who suddenly has developed this remarkable knack of scoring goals. First season they played together, Richard had 32 goals. Powered by the punchline, Montreal won the regular season title with 38 victories, double that of the previous year. Then, with Richard scoring 12 goals in nine playoff games, the Canadians won their first Stanley Cup in 13 years. The Canadians, who hadn't lost a home game uh, all year, played Toronto in the first round of the playoffs and lost the first game at home ice, three to one. <gasps> what a shock this was, you know? While well, they proceeded to win the next eight straight and win the Stanley Cup, but in game two of that series with Toronto, final score was Montreal five, Toronto one, and Richard scored all five goals. The three stars were announced as Richard, Richard, and Richard. In his third year, Richard exploded, eclipsing the single-season goal-scoring record of 44 by netting 50 in 50 games. If you wanted to even consider yourself an offensive-minded player in the National Hockey League, you could uh, strut around rather proudly having scored 15, 18, 20 goals. To score 50 in 50 games. Nobody had ever scored that many goals, and since the Rockets ascent to stardom happened so fast, it was breathtaking to see what he was doing. But it's very important to remember this all was done against wartime opposition. I mean, there were some pretty terrible goalies that he was shooting at. There was a guy playing for the Rangers named Steve Bozinski, who was arguably the worst goalie in the history of hockey, and his nickname proves it. His nickname was Steve Bozinski, the puck goes inski. 42-43, the hockey put in the red line. And they allowed, for the first time, they allowed passes over the defensive blue line. And who are you going to headman the puck coming through center ice to but Richard? Allowing the pass over the, over the defensive blue line did more to enhance the play of Richard than did the momentary depletion by World War II. And I can remember there was people in the Toronto media calling him a wartime hockey player. And then about 10 years after the war ended, and the Rockets scored 45 goals one year, I remember my father saying, well, it's a long war, eh? Richard's landmark season was the first of five in which he would win the goal-scoring title. He never shot in the same spot all the time. He will shoot one through your legs and on the ice and over your shoulder and the right shoulder, the left shoulder. He just had me guessing. I couldn't size him up at all. He'd always score. I'd go to church and light candles and everything else, and still didn't help me. And you always had your eye on the right side, because he was a right winger with a left-hand shot. And oh, boy, he got that puck, and he just put his shoulder down and wheeled in in the backhand. And he had a great backhand shot, I'll tell you. He always knew when he was on the ice. When he went off the ice, he went, Phew. 
Thank God he's gone off the ice. Once he got in there, there was only one way he was going to go, and you'd have to shoot him or lasso him or something to stop him. Earl Siebert was a defenseman, and Siebert was big for his time. He probably weighed over 200 pounds. He jumped on the rocket's back as the rocket took a pass at the blue line, and, and Richard kept skating with the puck. And the rocket made Deke the goaltender and pulled him out and threw it in as he's falling with, with uh, Siebert on his back. You, know, you don't see that very often. Siebert went back to the bench. He said, if any guy can carry me on his back from the blue line in, he deserves to score the goal. After winning the Stanley Cup in 1946, Montreal repeatedly fell in the playoffs as Toronto and Detroit controlled the Cup for the next six seasons. But as he showed in the 1952 playoffs, it wasn't because the Rocket wasn't playing at full force. Montreal-Boston semifinals, uh, seventh game, winner take all. It was a huge rivalry between the Bruins and the Canadians. It's just huge. And the Bruins had a forward named Leo Labine, who was tough, and he was good. So in the early part of the second period, Richard came down, and he tried to cut through the Bruins' defense. The rocket was coming down, and he didn't see Labine, and Labine cross-checked him, and he knocked the rocket unconscious. It was flat, out, looked like he was dead, and they told Dick Irvin, the coach, that he you know, he would not be able to play again. And the third period starts, and there's still no Richard. And you have to assume he's gone. And here are the Canadians trying to win this game without their star, and it's tied 1-1. And then late in the third period, who shows up on the Montreal bench but the Rocket? Somehow, when Morris came back and the face-off was in, in the Montreal end, he got control of the puck deep in his own end, and he went from one end to the other, all up the, the right boards. He was playing against uh, one Hall of Fame defenseman and Bill Quackenbush and Bob Armstrong. And they were on defense for Boston. And Quackenbush pushed him right into the corner. But somehow, with this absolute fierce drive, he circled around Quackenbush, even though he was fenced in, in the corner, circled around, came out in front of the crease, and jammed the puck past Sugar Jim Henry, who was the goalie. And how Morris got around him behind him and came out in front and moved Armstrong out of the way, I'll never know. And of course, the goal won the game in the series. And after the game, the Rocket and Henry, who was also battered himself, was wearing uh, bandages. He himself had been through hell. They shook hands at center ice. And if you ever want to see a picture of two warriors at the end of a game, nothing says it more. You script that for Hollywood, and they say, it's phony, you know? But that's exactly what happened. Knocked out, comes back, scores the winning goal. That was him. That was him. As Richard's legend grew, his profile as one of the NHL's arch intimidators gathered layers of mythology. William Faulkner, the great American novelist, uh, at one point was, uh, was asked by Sports Illustrated to uh, write, write a piece about Richard. William Faulkner wrote that Richard's eyes had the fatal quality of snakes. He had this habit of glaring at people, and it was almost like sunlight focused through a magnifying glass. It almost burned holes in you. He had a, a great deal of difficulty uh, controlling his temper. He was so intense, winning was so important, and. Uh, He'd get himself worked up to the point where he would snap a little bit. He was the, one of the best fighters that the game of hockey ever saw. He's the best one-punch fighter I've ever seen. In he knocked guys out, right, left, and center. I mean, I don't mean just knocked them down. He knocked them out. And you know, they went, they went after him big time. My father always said Rock had to fight his way through the league. The Rangers had a defenseman named Bob Dill. Killer Dill was his nickname, and he had he had been a Golden Gloves boxer. In that particular game against the Rangers, Bob Dill challenged the Rocket to a fight in the penalty box. The Rocket knocked him out. It was in the first period. In the third period, Dill thought it might be a little bit different, so he challenged the Rocket again. They both wound up in the box for high sticking. And the Rocket knocked him out again. Two KOs of a guy who had been a Golden Gloves champ. Not bad. Dick Irvin uh, coaching Morris felt that the way to get the most out of Morris was to keep him boiling. 
Dick used to say to him when he'd come off the bench, don't let those guys do that to you. Well, Morris would get steamed up and he'd go at the next shift and he'd take a whack at somebody. I know Sid Abel, the great Detroit center, talks about the Rocket having a battle with Howe and then a battle with Lindsay and the Rocket had not done too well in them because those were tough guys. And there's somebody on my back and I remember leaning on one knee and this little head come out underneath <laughs> just a little farther and I bopped him a good one. The rocket slipped and went down and he had to come up right beside boot nose to Sid Abel. Boot nose, he had his nose broken so often they call him boot nose. So he couldn't help but say, you know, what's the matter, Rocket? You finally met your match or something? I won't. <laughs> he hit boot nose, he broke boot nose's nose again. <laughs> what you saw was how he was. He couldn't contain his emotions. He wore the CH, but he also wore his emotions out there. And I think that's what made him so very attractive to so many people, because you could see the man behind the player. And it was all rolled into one. And that's awfully attractive in any era. Richard's rage to win sometimes spilled over into his family life. I would say he was the same man on ice as he was in real life. But when he got mad, we knew what we had to do sit down and be quiet. It was somebody uh, with a very hot temper, even off the ice. The single calming influence on Richard was his wife, Lucille, who faithfully watched home games from her seat in the forum. It must have been tough for her to fulfill all the, the commitments that it took to be the Rockets' wife. And I'm sure he wasn't easy to live with either. With having a temperament like that and having the, the strong desire that he had, he must have must have had times at home that he would have been difficult to live with, especially when things weren't going the way he considered they should be. After the Canadians lost to the Red Wings without the suspended Richard in the 1955 Stanley Cup Finals, Dick Urban was replaced as coach by Toe Blake. The change signaled the beginning of the NHL's greatest dynasty. The feeling was that Blake would be able to control the rocket, to mellow him just enough to enable him to become less crazy but more productive. And it worked. Richard's spirits improved further when his younger brother became his teammate. The rocket was getting up there in years, but a miracle happened. He opened up training camp in September 1955, and there's this little skinny kid who looked like he should have been a stick boy. And his name was Henri Richard. So it looked like the kid was there for a laugh. Every game in the scrimmages and the exhibitions, there was one major problem. Henri Richard was the best player on the ice. They were going to send Henry back to junior. I've read this dozens of times, and uh, he was so good at training camp. He was the best guy. He said, I'm going to make this team, and at 19, he made it. So you had Henri playing with his much older brother, and this was just a tonic for the Rocket. The Richard brothers together was like dynamite in a match. Tremendous combination. And if you look over history at the great combos of all time, Adam Oates, Brett Hull, Wayne Gretzky, Yari Curry. You could put right up at the top of that list, Maurice and Henri Richard. The Brother Act produced 57 goals and 54 assists in 1956, as the Canadians won the first of five consecutive Stanley Cups. The Canadians teams from 55 to 60, probably as good as any group that has ever been put together. There was nobody as good as Jock Wong. So number one, we had the best goaltender in the world ever. Number two, we had the best defenseman in the world ever, and Doug Harvey. Number three, we had the best center iceman in the world, and, and, and John Bellow. A lot of teams may have one or two superstars, but we had six or seven. Over five seasons, the Canadians won four regular season titles and 10 straight playoff series. But in the midst of his team's glorious run, Richard's star had already begun to dim. He had been very badly injured during the latter part of the dynasty. 
player named Mark Rayum of the Maple Leafs, a defenseman, had collided with him, and Rayum's skate sliced through the Rockets' tendon. It was a miracle that he was able to come back and play. It was a terrible injury, terrible. And the injury, coupled with his age, really militated against anything like the Rocket we had seen before. After Montreal won the Stanley Cup in 1960, Richard was the subject of retirement rumors. My pop said to him, look, you want to play? We want you to play. But you got to do a couple things. You got to get yourself in shape, and you got to stay in shape. Because the last thing that I will allow you to do is to play here fat, overweight, out of shape, and have the people boo you. And I think Morris made the decision right then and there that I can't lose the kind of weight that I have to lose to do this. The time had come. They won the cup, and it was the absolute perfect time for a hockey player, a great player, to retire. The last two years have been very tough. Uh, I was overweight, first of all. I had four, five, sometimes six pound overweight, and it was hard for me to follow the other guys. After an unsatisfying stint as a glad hander for the team's public relations department, Richard went to work for team president David Molson. The Rocket expected to be involved in hockey decisions. He was the assistant to a guy who didn't give him anything to do. So he picked up his hat and said, uh, you know, enough of this, and left. After 23 years with the Canadians, Richard went from star athlete to small businessman. In the, uh, in the 60s, and into the 70s, he had he had an operation in his basement where he would literally spool crank the fishing line onto reels and package these and send them off like a mail order, uh, a mail order business. The picture can be painted as somewhat sad of this man sitting in his basement at an old plywood table winding, you know, spools of thread like a doughty ant or something and selling them. Said he was quite happy, he caught him fishing a lot. In the late 60s, Richard found new life when a group of retired NHL players formed a team and competed for charity. It's too bad the public couldn't have seen him. Uh, like when we barnstormed across the country, we had our own bus, eh? And if you could have seen Rocket relax and enjoy just with his own gang in the bus, just with the team, and the kibitzing is going on, and the tears running down his cheeks from laughing, the people wouldn't believe what I saw. The thing that, that was tough for him was that uh, everywhere he went, even five, six, seven years after, people expected him to, you know, to score uh, three, four or five goals every game. He was not capable all the time to do that, and he felt bad. He, he played with such desire that, uh... He, he almost had a heart attack on the ice, and he got dizzy spells. And the doctors told him that, you know, he was just a little old to be playing. He was 50 or 60, 56 or 60 years old at the time. He was a guy that couldn't be away from the game. In 1972, Richard tried coaching the Quebec Nordiques of the World Hockey Association. But his incendiary temper and introverted personality were not meant for the bench. He quit after two games. When Sports Century returns, Maurice Richard returns to the Canadian's fold and bids farewell to the ice on which much of his legend was written. And it went on and on and on. And Rocket, a man of great emotions, couldn't contain his emotions. It was an amazing evening because I think this was people's way of saying goodbye. We all combed our hair like Maurice Richard, and we used a kind of hair glue to keep it in place. We laced our skates like Maurice Richard, we taped our sticks like Maurice Richard. We cut his picture out of all the newspaper, and we knew everything there was to know about Maurice Richard. There was something very earthy about him that appealed to people in Montreal. They sensed he was one of them, perhaps like no other player before and no other player since. When it comes to feeling young, a lot of it's up here. Three years ago, Maurice Richard said goodbye, gray hair, hello, Grecian Formula 16. Everybody in Quebec 
who didn't see Rocket play, saw him make a commercial for Grecian Formula where a referee skates by and say, Hey, Richard, two minutes for looking so good. At that point, Rocket Richard was an avuncular figure. He was everybody's uncle in the province. And that made no sense to me because throughout his playing days, there was nothing avuncular about Rocket Richard. There were things that were combative, compelling, but somehow he managed to morph into everybody's family friend. In 1994, Richard lost the best friend he ever had. His wife, Lucille, succumbed to cancer shortly after their 51st wedding anniversary. She was everything to him in his life. He never had to do a thing at home. She did everything for him, and that was a big shock to him when it happened. When we lost our mother, I never saw somebody cry like my father did. He was very, 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 very sad and very sorry, and he had a hard time coming out of it. And it's a good thing he met someone else a few months later, because uh, I don't think he could have lived alone. By the 1990s, the Canadians had new owners, and they welcomed back the Rocket, hiring him as a goodwill ambassador. On March 11th, 1996, Richard felt the love of millions when the Canadians played their final game in the Forum. Almost all of the living Hall of Famers who play, ever played for the Montreal Canadiens come out onto the ice. And the last person to be introduced was naturally going to be Maurice. La plus grande légende de l'histoire du hockey, le numéro 9, Maurice Rocket Richard. It brought tears to my eyes when the rocket was introduced. He started to cry, so everybody else around him started to cry. And it was just an ovation that you'll never hear again. It was almost a 10-minute ovation. It just simply would not stop, even though he raised his hands and tried to stop it. And it was just uh, it was an amazing moment. There they were applauding him and thanking him and making him feel a little uncomfortable out there, but it was well deserved. He's the one who really, he saved the building and he saved the franchise for them. And as the ovation continued on and on, I stood there and I looked around the building and I thought to myself, 75%, 85% of the people in this building tonight never saw him play. They never saw him score a goal even on television. He hadn't scored a goal in 37 years. And the fact that he was being received this way, people were crying. A year later, it was revealed that Richard was battling stomach cancer. He knew at that time that he was very sick, but he, he didn't want people to know it. He didn't want to show it. He was fighting all the time. Well, when he first came down with the cancer, I know I made the statement saying, he'll beat it because he's such a competitor. The last hour in his bed, actually, he was trying to get out of the bed. We had to hold him down. He would say, I want to go back home. And he was, he was still strong. That was a few hours before he died. Three days after his death on May 27, 2000, his body lay in state at the Molson Center as a stream of humanity, more than 100,000 strong, flowed slowly past his coffin. The thing that did uh, strike me the most is the, the people. It's the emotion, the respect, the love. On May 31st, Maurice Rocket Richard was laid to rest after a state funeral. When the Cardinal finished his eulogy, the crowd stood up and applauded. I've been in a lot of churches in my lifetime, and I've been to a lot of funerals, and I've never, ever experienced anything like this. He was right up there with the Pope. 
He was a tough man, and they just adored him. Well, Morris will always be Morris as far as I'm concerned. Anybody that saw him will never forget him, and those who didn't see him don't know what they missed. I've known athletes all over the world. Nobody had the desire and determination of Rocket Richard and a hundred years from now, the kids will be reading about it in their history books. The Rocket was Babe Ruth on skates. When the Rocket got the puck, it was like everybody in the arena just got five shots of adrenaline. There was never a player as focused, as forceful, and as gifted in what he did, which was scoring goals. I have to go back to his special skills of scoring goals in the clutch, 50 and 50, the 500 goals. Those are the things that people will remember that he did first. What he symbolized to the French Canadian people, I think as a socio-political icon, puts him on the same platform as Jesse Owens, Jackie Robinson, and Muhammad Ali. He transcended the game, he touched people's lives, and he probably did more in terms of defining notions of Canada and, and Canadians to people of both French and English cultures than any politician, any great statesman, any great novelist, any rock star. He was the definitive emblem of Canada. During Richard's career, a poster hung on the wall of the Montreal locker room in the Forum. A quote from Abraham Lincoln, it read, I do the very best I know how, the very best I can, and I mean to keep on doing so until the end. In the end, Richard's stature in Quebec approached that of Lincoln himself. He's not the Pope, a team publicity man once said. No, agreed a colleague, he is a god. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.